Well, we're so excited to be here tonight. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is, I love speaking at women's conferences, right? Because <laughs> they actually awesome worship. Yeah. Like men don't yeah. worship and it's so annoying. And uh, Irene and I, first of all, we absolutely love that we get to do this together. Mm -hmm. Um, We have been married 23 years. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it's been about the best seven years ever. You can hear a little bit about that tonight. But as as you you all worship, and I felt the Holy Spirit just speak a word into my heart, uh, that some of you need to realize that you already have a testimony. And, and, and a lot of times when we come into moments like this and we're hearing things and we're, we start to get almost like jealous that it hasn't happened in our lives yet to the degree, come on somebody, that it has happened in somebody else's life. But I just want to encourage you before I jump in that if you look back over your life, somebody died in the thing you're still living in. Somebody got in an accident, somebody had the surgery and didn't make it out and God has protected you and kept you. And sometimes you need to look at God's resume in your life and say, God, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I don't know where I would be. You may not be where you want to be, but can anybody give God praise that you're not where you used to be? Come on, somebody. Does anybody have a testimony in the room tonight that God's been faithful, that God's been good, that God's been kind, that his grace and his mercy have gone before us and protected us? I need y'all to do a little bit better than that. Does anybody have a testimony about the blood of Jesus? That the blood of Jesus kept you. Great is his faithfulness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Oh, precious is the flow. That makes me white as snow. Has anybody got a testimony that you can say, great is God's faithfulness. Every morning I wake up, new mercies I see. I feel like preaching right now. I preach from a stool. But every time we get to share our story, we we, we kind of feel like we operate in another level of God's favor and we get to steward his story. And I want you to just get you, like the word testimony in the original word, it means do it again. Right. And many of us got things in our lives that we're like, man, God, we don't want you to do that again. But when you testify of God's goodness, when you read, let me help y'all. The, Jesus, God parting the Red Sea is not fiction. Uh huh. It, it's not fiction. Like, like, like water turning into wine ain't fiction. So when you don't have a testimony of your own, you testify of God's goodness and what he's already done. And then you get to operate in the favor and the presence and in the honor and the anointing of what God did. So we're going to share our testimony tonight. And uh, we only sharing it for, for, for this reason, that God would do it again in your life. Amen. That God would do it again in your family, in your marriage, in your kids. And so we get a chance to do yeah. that. And she's like, she'll probably write down, don't preach already, Jimmy. You are crazy. No, you can do your thing. I think everybody's ready for it. Y'all ready for the word so we can bring it. Um, I want to show you my kids. Y'all got the picture of my kids, my family. Where are we? There we go. Yay. Aren't they so Y'all see that lean I got right there? Look. Uh, What's up? What's up, girl? All of this is me. so crazy. (laughs) That's Maya, my 17-year-old on the end. I'm almost an empty nester. She's a senior. My son, Jaden, is 20 now. He's, like, gained 30 pounds in muscle since this picture. He's not dating, though. He ain't all the way saved. We're trying to work on him. He ain't ready yet. Y'all he's don't want him yet. He's working on his test. Some of you are like, oh, he's cute. No, no, he ain't ready yet. Uh-huh. He cute, but nasty. You ain't ready yet. Uh-uh, he's not, he's not nasty. Uh, he, he, yeah, okay. He's, he, yeah, well, anyway. And that's Kayla on the end, my 21-year-old. She's amazing. She just relocated to Dallas, working for a church out there in production. My ministry kid. That's right. Yep. And we're about to be empty nesters. About to be empty I'm nesters. I'm starting, I won't be none. Mm. Let me tell you, this phase of life is good. I'll kiss you right now. This phase of life is good. Y'all want to see that? Y'all anybody? Come on, get, come on, get some of this. <laughs> come on. Mm. Hey. He is so so embarrassing. Oh my gosh. It's y'all see her blushing? Now look, now look, look, look. Y'all see that? I'm telling y'all. Yeah, you can't don't... even talk. Stop. Stop it. Okay. Anyway, so we actually met on the job. We, I was 21, you were 23, 24, 24 something like that. 
and he was just as charismatic back then. I'll never forget it. We were both technical recruiters, so we were headhunters for IT uh, professionals. So we've been connecting and relating since, you know, forever. That's like what we do. We love connecting and relating with people. And I remember I was dating a guy, 21 years old, and I was like, man, this guy is getting on my nerves. I'm it wasn't on the phone me. It was somebody with else. my sister. And I'm like, yeah, I just broke up with him today. And, you know, I just, I just want male companionship. I'm so sick and tired of this dating game. And I'll never forget it. I hung up the phone. And lo and behold, I looked up two seconds later. I'll make love to you like you want. Oh. Standing by my wedding. cubicle. I'm sorry, y'all. That was wedding night. I, this I, was, one. I fast forwarded a little bit. Standing by uh, my cubicle, the like very hey girl. first time <laughs> that I saw your brown eyes. See. My lips said hello, and I said. Hi. <laughs> oh my gosh. So he's asking me out, and I'm like, I don't date my coworkers. Sorry, but he, y'all, he was a, a little creepy. He was spying on me through the cubicle listening to my conversation with my sister and was like, ooh, this is my moment, and jumped on it. So we go out on our first date. I gave you a chance because you, you had mentioned, you know, you, well, you, that you were And I was incredibly Jesus. irresistible. Yes, of course. Yes. Um, and we... Uh, <clears throat> so I'm like, oh, he had mentioned his relationship with Jesus in the interview, which he probably shouldn't be doing. But I, I was like, okay, I trust this guy. I'll go out on a date with you. Plus, I had a whole bunch of questions to ask about God and this whole Christianity thing because I grew up Catholic and I just didn't understand the whole church flow. So we go out on this date. And let me tell you, it was like sparks were flying the whole time. We were in the Baltimore Inner Harbor in the aquarium, and we were walking through the windy, like, aquarium, and it was sharks and dark around us, and you were putting your arm around me. It was like a moment, right? Went out to dinner. On the way home to my apartment, he starts singing worship songs to me. And I was like, I had never met a guy who, like, sang worship. And it wasn't Jodeci, it was worship songs. And I start crying and I'm like, why am I crying? He's like, that's the Holy Spirit and all this type of stuff. Anyway, fast forward, I literally sat on the couch with him when he said, I'm, we're not gonna be, our relationship is not gonna be physical because let me tell you, I, when we kissed, it was like sparks were flying I had to slow her everywhere. Down. I was like, okay. whoa, whoa, girl. He did, Back I'm gonna up. be honest. Because I didn't know any other way. Can't touch this. Right? But like I told you this morning, I didn't know guys like that existed with standards that would wait. So I was like, you know what? I am so sick and tired of guys literally uh, using me for my, what I bring to the table physically and not for my heart and my mind. I poked him on the shoulder. I'm like, are you real? I love everything that's different about this guy. Absolutely amazing what God can do. Um, just through obedience mm -hmm. yeah. and through the waiting game. Mm -hmm. And just prophetically, I just want to speak, uh, those of you who are single or those of you who are, have gone through a, a divorce or, you know, you know what you thought was going to happen didn't happen. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know that just because it's your second time doesn't mean you deserve God's second best. There is no such thing. God still has a best for you. And we want to share about this marriage that started in 1999 on this thought, I love everything that's different about you. And from that moment, what Irene didn't know is that it had been prophesied over my life. I was going around preaching at student conferences back then, and a lady came up to me after a student conference. She said, uh, son, I have a word for you, and I, and, I, and I received it. And she goes, stop looking for your wife. God's going to send her, and she's going to love everything that's different about you confirmation and it was confirmation and I know it doesn't happen like that for everybody but what we have come to discover in our marriage mm -hmm. that marriage relationships start at capacity I mean they start at compatibility mm -hmm. right but they end or they are uh, uh, let's say defined in capacity mm -hmm. our capacity of love for one another our capacity of going through hard times for one another. And we want to jump into this passage of scripture in Acts chapter 16. We're going to frame this up. Uh, uh, and I absolutely love to preach this message. We're going to call this purpose in the prison. Purpose in 
the prison. It says in Acts 16, 9 and 10, it says that night, Paul had a vision. Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with Paul. Paul and Silas, come over to Macedonia and help us. So the scripture says that Paul and Silas decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded, and I love this, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news of the gospel Mm -hmm. there. Now here's the deal. It's a great like first day of ministry. Like here are two guys, Paul and Silas, they're called to do the work of ministry. They're called to spread the good news of the kingdom. But on the way there, they got falsely accused. When they got to Macedonia, uh, uh, you know, they're, the anointing that was on their lives messed up the enemy's plan for that city. Yeah. And as they got falsely accused, they ended up uh, being put in jail. And then it says this in Acts 16, and pick, I'm going to pick it up at verse 22 and 24. A mob formed quickly against Paul and Silas, mm-hmm. and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten. And they were thrown into prison. And then the jailer was ordered to make sure that they did not escape. So the jailer put them in the inner prison or the printer or the prison within the prison and clamped their feet in stocks. How many of y'all know that that's a bad first day of ministry? That's a bad first day of being called to this city and we get we end up in jail. But what we find through Paul and Silas's story is that there is purpose inside of the prison. It reminds me of a story when we first, uh, you know, we're doing ministry. Uh, you know, I worked for my parents. My parents were pastors, so I was really bad. <laughs> and, and, and that's not the case for it's all where of my It was son definitely my case. From. Um, and, yeah. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, I was on the worship team. And back then, you know, when you were a PK, you did all the jobs for free in the church. And so I was the janitor. Uh-huh. I, I, I delivered mail. I built buildings. Come on, somebody. Like, I did it all. Uh, but, but, uh, but the worship leader was my main job, and I had, I played worship. I was the worship leader from the drums. Come on, y'all had the Janet Jackson microphone on with the big puff. Can't see nobody's mouth. You know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and, and it was just me and this guy named Steve. Steve was the keyboard player, and Steve played the keyboard. He played the, he played the you know, he played the keys on the bottom and the bass on the top, and, and we were the worship team. We was all of it. We were the singers. We were the drummer with percussion. We were all of it. Mm-hmm. Back then, we used to sing the song called Sunrise, Sunset. I'm going to praise his name. Come on, little Ron Cannoli. Oh, Ron Cannoli. I'm going up to the high places to tear the devil's kingdom. Yeah. And, 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 and so call time that Sunday morning, never forget it, was 8 o'clock and church started at 9, no Steve at 8.15, no Steve at 8.30, no Steve at 8.45, no Steve at 9. We got to start. Even though it's black church, we're going to start on time. (laughs) So we start on time. No Steve. Acapella worship. Come on, somebody. It was just me. Come on, just, you know, he's an on time God. Back then, yes, he is. Oh, 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 he's an on time God. Yes, he is. Uh huh. This is us. Uh huh. Come on. Steve, man, I come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's an on time God. Yes, he is. It was really bad worship. Man, that was good. So Steve is not around. Mm-hmm. I'm mad. It was warfare. Mm-hmm. I'm leading worship but cussing at the same time where Steve. <laughs> Steve calls me on Monday morning. He says, PJ, you'll never guess what happened. I said, what? He's like, I said, where were you? He says, I was locked up. I said, what do you mean? True story. He said, I was in jail. So what happened was I was on the way to church. I got pulled over. Didn't know my registration. We live in Baltimore, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Like, didn't know my registration was expired. And, and they locked me up. And I didn't want to spend my one phone call to let you know I was going to be late for church. <laughs> so tell me about it. He says, well, they put me in with this prisoner, this this." this, this guy who was in for 
attempted homicide. A worship leader. Come on. He's supposed to sing Break Every Chain that Sunday. <laughs> I said, what'd you tell him? He said, so I lied. I said, what'd you tell him? He goes, well, I told him I got jumped and beat a whole bunch of people down because I don't want to lose my life. Hilarious. And he ended up getting out Monday. And I thought about Steve as we were praying for you tonight, that many of us, we grew up in church. We, we serve in church. We, on the worship team, we're leading small group. Maybe we just started coming to church. But many of us are carrying around an inner prison. It's crazy to me how even worship leaders can end up locked up. It's amazing to me that pastors and leaders, if you're watching anything in Christendom right now, you can see that people are wrecking their entire lives because of inner prisons that no one knows about. And we can see with Paul and Silas that they were in an inner prison. And the odds are that right now you are sitting next to people that have inner prisons. They have a prison within the prison. They have a story behind the story. You see them in church, how you doing? Oh, we're blessed, God is good, but really you're stressed, you're angry, you're depressed, you're discouraged, you're a little jacked up, you're a little confused, your, your past is calling you, but you don't know, should I be real in this moment? Cause should I tell somebody, what, is church a safe place to really open up? Uh, because I've heard that church isn't safe. And we're carrying in the prison, and that's exactly where Irene and I were after 15 years mm -hmm. of being married. Here we were doing marriage, doing life. And if you were here this morning, you heard me share a little bit about how we were leading a church. We were actually serving his parents. I was popping out babies all through my 20s, right? Doing life. And when we, I got to my early 30s, um, we started leading the church ourselves as the senior leaders. And let me tell you something. I had no idea the weight and responsibility it was to lead a church. That's why your pastors deserve honor. And that's why we need to pray for them. I had no clue how much weight and responsibility it was, how much grief I would experience. Because I wasn't just experiencing my own grief. Imagine experiencing the grief of all the people in the church. It was intense. Then we experienced betrayal. Um, gosh, yeah, people leave the church. They don't belong to me. Imagine that. But I didn't know how angry. to deal with it. And they left angry. When they and left I wanted angry, to smack a, f a couple people, but I couldn't. You know what I'm saying? Like in an anointing, you're supposed to, you know, lay hands. I wanted to throw hands. <laughs> he sure did. And I didn't know how to deal with my emotional world. Remember, I told you I didn't address my emotions. I didn't know I had permission to say things out loud, like I'm hurt by the sheep, the people that I'm called to serve, right? So what I did was I stuffed and I numbed my emotions. And when we introduced alcohol back into our lives on vacation, I was 30, 32 years old. I did not realize that I was reawakening an alcoholic. Some, this little girl that started drinking at age 10 Okay, when I was exposed to alcohol, I didn't realize I was waking up the beast. And what happened was over a six year period of time that we were leading our church, church growing, people getting saved. I mean, we were serving the community, doing great things for God. But I was dying on the inside, becoming more anxious, becoming uh, just taking on other people's grief as if it was my own. Everyone else's problems were my own. I was carrying shame that I wasn't enough wasn't good enough and never would be enough to be married to him and lead a church. So with those secret messages, I ended up medicating with alcohol. And Jimmy, as I shared earlier today also, that he was medicating with food. And I want to show you a picture of what our inner prisons looked like. Do you have the pictures? Can you put up the shame picture or the weight picture? Either one. Okay. We don't have them, maybe we don't, there we go. This is Jimmy at his heaviest. I purposely took a selfie so that I could 
he could see the picture. You should see some of them looking at me and looking back like, my God. I wanted him to see because he couldn't see. See, when you're in denial and denial has you, and y'all right there and that, my girls, y'all know what I'm talking about. When denial has you and you are denying that you have an issue, even though everybody else could see it on the outside, right? I was 420 pounds. But he could not admit that he had a problem. And I was blacking out, drinking and driving, um, couldn't remember what happened the day before, fighting with you on a regular basis, hurting my kids, and I didn't have a problem with alcohol? Hmm. And here we are leading a church. And I, I want to frame this up because we're going to say some things. You're like, man, they're being real. Because I was fake for so long and it's exhausting. Yeah. And what we found out is it's impossible to keep up with who you pretend to be. Yeah. And so uh, uh, we were, it was awful. I, I remember preaching and God is using our church. Our church is growing. We had just launched this church and, and it grew 555 people the first year. We had our first Easter service. 3,000 people showed up. God's doing all these things. People are calling me to preach all around the world. And what happened is, is this table, this pulpit, it became, this was addicting to me. The accolades from people became addicted, uh, addicting to me. The stage became addicted to me and that I didn't know who I was not being behind one of these. And so here she is struggling with alcohol. Now I'm struggling with rejection. And the only thing that didn't reject me was food and pornography. And so here's the pastor preaching messages. People are getting set free. People are getting delivered. But I couldn't get delivered from pornography. I couldn't get delivered from this food addiction that was satiating. I thought it was satiating hunger. No, it was satiating hurts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it got to a point in 2012 where I called my, my pastor and I said, no longer can I fake this anymore. I'm struggling. I can't do this anymore. I am carrying a prison. It is too heavy to carry. Success is not what I thought it was because what I learned, and I want to tell you this tonight if you're taking notes, if you win at the wrong thing, you will lose at the right thing. I was winning at the wrong thing, but no one knows I was losing privately. And many of us are sitting in here tonight and we're going to share this story and you're going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe uh, uh, that they're sharing that. No, I'm not sharing it for you to hear. I'm sharing it you to think. To think about the inner prisons that you're carrying. To think about the stuff that has been passed down from generation to generation. Think about the stronghold. And, and, and somebody has to have an attitude tonight that it stops with me. My grandmama did it, my great-grandmama did it, my mama did it, and now I'm doing it. And my kids, if you're not going to do it for yourself, I love the word that you said last night about teaching our kids how to fight in the spirit, and how to break strongholds. You cannot break a stronghold with a strong effort. You need a strong presence of God. Somebody has to say tonight, my kids don't deserve me to keep carrying this so it doesn't get passed down to them and I am telling you right now yes Irene is sitting here six years uh, almost seven years sober I'm sitting here 150 pounds lighter and free from all of the things my hurts my habits and my hang-ups and I want to tell you tonight I don't want you to cheer as to celebrate us I want you to praise God because tonight I refuse to let anybody leave out of this room bound by the things that have been so easily entangled you in tonight you're getting set free and let me help you right now look at the person next to you right now I feel this in my spirit and says tonight you're getting delivered tonight you're getting healed come on tell them right now tonight uh-huh we're breaking the shame of addiction tonight somebody you came in I refuse I triple dog dare you to get free tonight and the Bible says he who the Sun sets free is free indeed. That indeed is like free.
to the tenth power. That indeed is like not just a conqueror, but more than a conqueror. That indeed, come on, somebody says, no longer am I not on this mat, but this mat is now a testimony. And tonight, God, I, I want to prophesy that God is going to take your greatest misery and shift it around to become your greatest ministry. Tonight, he who the sun sets free is free. It's free. Indeed. It's free. Indeed. indeed. You got to say with an attitude and free indeed. I ain't scared. So, babe, how do we get free? Number one, we got free because we had to lean into the pain first. Lean into the pain. See, I thought that touching pain would kill me. I thought that having hard conversations was going to kill me. I avoided confrontation. Do I, where are my people who avoid confrontation? Where are my nines on the Enneagram? We like peace. But peace for the sake of peace is not really peace. It's resentment. It's resentment. It's fear. It's yep. doubt. It's discouragement. It's anxiety. It's anxiety. It's all of those things. So I had to start leaning into the pain of my past, leaning into the pain of these hot button issues that were coming up in my marriage. Because let me tell you something. Have you ever thought of the fact that everything that brought you together, so these differences about Jimmy Rollins that I loved in the beginning, I began to really hate over time. He got on my nerves, right? Like our differences were meant to bring us together, like opposites attract, like it's a thing. We're, because we're trying to, here, here's what I'm trying to say, we're trying to accomplish something we didn't get in childhood through our spouse. We're trying to get it through our spouse. And we choose that way unconsciously, did y'all know that? There's a science behind it. It's really cool. So here's Jimmy Rollins and uh, I, and we are um, in our inner prisons and family of origin stuff, hot button issues are coming up. And we had these moments where we realized our dysfunction, yeah. right? And the, remember I told you earlier today how it's like we became aware that we were ignorant and we became aware of some things that we needed to deal with. And... Can you just take it from here? Because I'm kind of one of the things that we losing my train of thought. We love to say because you, you keep miss moving the notes. Yes. Oh, stop moving the I notes. I lost where I was. My ADD. Go ahead. Jeremiah <laughs> six, your oh. scripture fourteen yes. and sixteen yes. says you yes. cannot heal a wound by saying it's not there. Yes. You cannot heal a wound by yes. saying it is not there. And what we have pain. come to discover that the same pain that divides us is the same pain that can. Mm -hmm. Unite us. The Bible says that Paul and Silas were beaten mm -hmm. with wooden rods. Severely beaten. Mm -hmm. I don't hear them complaining. I, I don't hear them saying, woe is me. I don't hear them blaming everyone else. Mm -hmm. That's what we like to do. It's yeah. my mama's fault. It's my daddy's fault. It's the guy who inappropriately touch me, it's his fault. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that I carry all of this. Mm -hmm. And when you lean into the pain, you come into a season where you say, you know what? I am no longer gonna allow people to live in my head rent free. Rent -free. It is time for some of you to give your past an eviction notice. That's right. That it must leave your soul, it must leave your mind, it has to leave your thoughts. It's been keeping you up late at night and the only way that you can get rid of it is to lean into it. Let me tell y'all something. Mm -hmm. Pain is a beautiful teacher. Yeah, it is. There's no better teacher than pain, but maybe it is in a moment like this, it's someone else's. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I lean into someone else's pain, I don't have to experience my own. You see, when you start feeling the emotions of something, you realize that discouragement, anxiety, fear, it's, it's an indicator. It's not telling you to run away from it. Mm -hmm. It's telling you to lean into it. You see, what I've come to understand is emotions, they are amazing consultants but horrible CEOs. That's good. Your emotions are telling you something. It's time to do something. Yeah. But the CEO, that will that is inside of you says, I'm no longer taking this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, how about this? I'm not going to complain anymore. Where is that getting me? 
Right. If you always do the things you've done, you always get the things you've gotten. Mm -hmm. It's time to do something different. Yeah. And Paul and Silas leaned into the pain. They had to have a moment that says, God, what are you doing in this? What do you want to do through this? God, how are you going to use this? Uh, Paul and Silas had to begin to, I believe, get a picture of their future selves, mm -hmm. to get a picture of their free selves. Do you have a picture of you free? Yeah. I feel like preaching right there. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm picturing them not blaming, not complaining about their ish, the pain, not minimizing the pain. How many of us in here have minimized pain that we experienced? It's not okay that that person abused you, called you out of your name, abused your trust, left you, abandoned you, re like rejected you. It's not okay. And that pain you will get stuck in yeah. if we do not touch it. We have to touch it. Second Corinthians lean 12, into it. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, my grace is always more than enough for you. And I love this, and my power, mm -hmm. Jesus said, my power finds its fullest expression in your weakness. Mm -hmm. God's power doesn't compete with yours. Yeah. It's too big for that. Mm -hmm. Where... We are weak, he is strong. Mm -hmm. In other words, I need to stop leading with everything I am and start leaning into everything I'm not. That's right. Because when I lean into everything I'm not, God's strength begins to work. One thing I love about you, can I just say this about you, is Jimmy knows what he is not. That takes a lot of humility to be able to say, I am not these things. And then he hires and surrounds himself with people who can fill in all the blanks. But as we're sitting here, I'm, and I'm thinking about the, how many people in the room are married? Raise your hands. Let's look. Okay. How many, how many of y'all are happy? I'm joking. I'm joking. Jimmy. No, no, no. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do how that. How many people are single? Raise your hand loud, high and proud. Okay, great. Single. Hey, there's some single guys out there, babe. Yeah. So here we go. So here's the thing. When we're looking for a spouse... We are looking for someone it's who great. is going to be able to lean into pain with us. Our spouse is the person that's going to be a part of healing these painful areas of our life and vice versa. That's what God called the union of marriage to do. Reconcile, redeem. It's a model of so the good. gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why the enemy is after marriage. He yeah. wants it to fail because it makes Jesus look real bad. But let me tell you something. When we lean into the pain together, Jimmy has become my blueprint for growth. That thing that annoys him about me and me about him is actually the thing that God gave us to bring healing and growth in each other. So when we look at things through different lenses, we're not right. minimizing, we're not blaming, but we're leaning into pain. Like I finally started confessing and saying out loud how I felt about pain I experienced in my life and you began to be a part of that healing journey. So I just wanted to give you kudos for that. I think what that. she's saying, and especially to all the single ladies, mm -hmm. it's a song. <laughs> Anointing over abs. Yeah. That's basically what I'm trying You're to say. You're looking for the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. You got to be somebody who will lay hands on you. Who's going to walk Not through. put hands on you. Come on. Yeah. Somebody who would pray with you. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm telling you, like, I feel like because we keep going, we love this marriage thing. So, we're like, we want to make sure that you're setting yourselves up for what God has for you. Yeah. So, number one, we lean into the pain. Number two, we got to lean into people. Mm -hmm. I love this passage of scripture because it so explicitly says who was involved. And at midnight, Paul and Silas. Mm -hmm. I love that. And at midnight... Paul and Silas, Silas and Paul, Beth and Kevin, mm -hmm. and at midnight, Jimmy and Irene. Now, let me tell you what blows my mind about this. My dad, I grew up, my dad uh, was a prison warden. Mm -hmm. He ran all the, prison, all, all the, all the uh, prisons in the state of Maryland. And, and the first thing he'd say, I said, Dad, so, so what would happen when the, when the worst of the worst prisoners would come in? He said, well, first what we do is we pat them down. And then what we do is we isolate them. And the worst of the worst, they would put them in solitary confinement. Now, I got a chance to go to Alcatraz. 
and when I visited Alcatraz, y'all, it was crazy. And I said, I want you to show me the inner prison. Show me where the worst prison is. And it was dark and it was lonely and it was isolated and you could hear the echoes of everybody else around you. Can you imagine the echoes of pain and the echoes of suicide and the echoes of, of being beaten with wooden rods? But where the enemy messed up, this scripture, it says that this is like solitary confinement. But what happened where the enemy messed up? Like how they got out of this? He locked them up together. And some of you are sitting there tonight and, and you're feeling isolated, but you got a friend. You got a girlfriend sitting next to you. You got somebody who will pray for you and see nothing seasons. And let me tell you right now, go ahead and nudge him. Go ahead and nudge him. Say, girl, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're not alone. We're in this What I'm trying to tell you is right now you are sitting next to the equation of your breakthrough, the equation of getting out of your prison. Come on. The Bible says where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am also where a three-folded cord is not easily broken. Come on. You got a Shadrach with you. You got a Meshach with you. You got a Abednego with you. Because when Shadrach gets depressed, Meshach said, I got your back. When Abednego says, I'm having a bad day, Shadrach says, I'm having a good day. Thanks be to God who's going to give us the victory. Who will pray for you and see nothing seasons? Come on. I got to find my people. I got to get in a small group. I got to get in the church. I've got to serve the local church. I, gotta, I don't want to just go to Airborne. I got to be a part of Airborne. I got to give to Airborne. I got to tithe to Airborne. I got to pray for Airborne because my people are at, are at Airborne. Airborne. Find your people. people. That's right. Say it, say it like me. Say it like Baltimore. Say fine. fine. Come on, white girls. Yo. Yo. <laughs> Peoples. Now I got to put an S on it. Fine. I mean, you got to do your neck a little bit. Yo, Yo. peoples, oh my God. don't ever do that without me. Okay, I'm helping you. This is a diversity class. Don't go to work and do that tomorrow. <laughs> You're like, what's up, girl? Don't do that. Oh, my God. Hilarious. We got to find our people. Find our people. And we had people all along the way in our journey that I'm so grateful for. We have a, our, my friend Jen and Jim Wilkes. They, they're pastors in Ohio. We got real with them. We're like, we're struggling. They flew in, ministered to our kids, talked us through, and I was fighting this whole idea. I was just totally, insanely in denial about my alcoholism. I would not admit it, and I was not going to rehab. So I remember Jimmy just being so done and giving me the ultimatum, go to rehab or I'm leaving. So I flew, Jen was like, Jimmy, because he got real angry, real loud. He was so hurt by my behavior that and felt rejected by my drinking. He was saying things that were shaming me and it was actually enabling me to drink more. And we didn't realize that at the time. But Jennifer, thank God for Jennifer. She flew me up, I went into her house full of shame that something is wrong with me and she said, honey, I love you, but can we just take inventory of your life? It doesn't look too good. Let's pick a rehab center for you to go to. How about this one? They specialize in trauma. We can deal with all that other stuff. She had grace. She had no judgment. She would like loved on me. And I finally gave in. I needed Jim and Jennifer to speak into my life. They, they kept telling Jimmy, stop calling. You're messing everything up, remember? <laughs> But like we needed people. We needed people to coach us through to get the help we need, right? And like Antoinette, yeah. she was our, my really good friend. She was on, our, on staff at the church. She's still my really good friend. I needed her to fly me to rehab because I was going to drink myself into a, oblivion it, and probably never make it there if it was up to me. I needed somebody to hold me accountable. I think what we're trying to say is it's impossible to get free without people. Yeah, that's right. It's impossible. I mean, the Bible simply says, confess your sins to God that you may be forgiven. Confess your sins on one another, you may be healed. Many of us are walking around forgiven but not healed because we don't trust people. Mm-hmm. People is the equation. And I want to just give you a, just a quick thought because many of us will say, well, how can you be so real? Because I understood something, mm-hmm. that there's no such thing as perfection. 
But there is a such thing as freedom. And you may say, well, how did you get there? I'm going to give you a quick equation. It's not going to be on the screen, but it starts at transparency. Transparency is what I let you see. Mm -hmm. What Kevin and I had today, Pastor Kevin, is I was just transparent. We're going to be friends. You need to know I'm a little crazy. (laughs) Right? I'm being transparent. I'm saying I'm going to call out what you already see. You already see I'm a little crazy. So let me just put some definition to that and tell you where it came from. Are y'all with me? Some of y'all crazy. Come on, where you at? You're a little crazy. Uh Uh-huh. And if you don't have your hand up, that's your issue. But man, transparency is what I'll let you see. It's impossible to operate in transparency without honesty. Transparency will let you see. Then you get to vulnerability. That's what I'll let you know before you see it. Mm-hmm. Vulnerability is, is, is rolling the dice and says, listen, I'm a little scared to share this, but I was sexually abused when I was younger. Vulnerability says, I struggle. I, I, I love you. I don't want to judge you. you. You know, drinking might be okay for you, but not for me because let, let me, vulnerability, I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you like, it's these conversations that you have that lets people define your craziness. Mm-hmm. Man, I, I think some of us, We think it's everybody else's fault, but you will follow you to every church you go to. And every relationship. You will follow you every relationship that you are in. So I go from transparency to vulnerability. Now watch this. Then I can move to accountability. Accountability is what I let you hold. You can't hold me accountable if I haven't been honest. You can't hold me accountable if I haven't told you where this craziness comes from. And then I get to intimacy. Intimacy is when I have nothing to hide. I have a secret. Are y'all ready? You're like, he already said everything. (laughs) Here's my secret. I still struggle. I'm not perfect, but I'm free. Why? Because I have nothing to hide. There is nothing that could pop up on this screen about my past, my present, my yesterday, or my today that I haven't already told somebody. And what happens is, is you give the enemy too much power with secrets. Let me help you, ladies. You will always be as sick as your secrets. Ain't nothing odd. If you start talking about it, you rob the enemy of ammunition to remind you about it. But you do that through people. Mm -hmm. You got to lean into the pain. You got to lean into people. Number three, and I'm almost done. We're almost done. You got to lean into his presence. Mm -hmm. Man, Irene was at rehab for 45 days. No one, hardly anyone from our church knew. I was off for like the whole year because my pastor had put me on sabbatical because I got honest. He didn't fire me. He just said, hey man, you need a break. And some people ask me today is, well, why did you get to keep your job? Because I was honest. Because I didn't get caught. I told. Mm-hmm. And you were willing to do the work. And I was willing to do the work. We were willing to be accountable, and we got well. Tell them about you were at rehab, and I was in the basement at home. So I was at rehab, and Jimmy had come for um, family week. So they're teaching him all about how to communicate with me and how what I was experiencing that, you know, addiction is a disease and all this. And he's, like, wrapping his mind around everything. He's like, but why won't she admit she has a problem? It was day 38. I'm all the way in Wickenburg, Arizona, out in the middle of the desert, and I was fighting this thing. Even though I identified with other people's stories who had problems with alcohol, even though I identified with so many things that would make, put me in the category of, have, of being an alcoholic, I wouldn't admit it. Jimmy was all the way across the country in Maryland. 2,000 miles away. And he was basically sick and tired of being sick and tired of me denying it. 
And he said, you know what? I'm going to lean into God's presence because everything I'm saying, everything I'm doing, being angry is not fixing this. It's not making her change. So those of you out there who have a family member who's struggling with addiction, it's not your fault. There's nothing you can do about it. They may never stop doing whatever it is or abusing whatever it is. But here's what can change you That's right. and your posture. You can so good, release right? it to God. And Jimmy got into God's presence. He got in, on his knees in our basement, which wasn't finished. And he took, um, uh, you took chalk, didn't you? And like drew circles with yeah, scripture. I, I, I put her, her name, Mark Batterson, who wrote this book, Circle Maker. Mm -hmm. And so I just started writing out circles. I ain't know, I was just, I was just, if Mark, if it worked for Mark, it was going to work for me. That's what I was thinking. Just, so I started praying about yeah. the places that I went to the places where we fought. Mm -hmm. I went to the places where Irene got inebriated and passed out in the bathroom. I went mm -hmm. to the places where I punched holes in the wall. Mm -hmm. And I began to reclaim my space with God's presence. And I began to pray. Mm -hmm. Like you've never prayed before. And what I didn't know at the very moment. They got this app on the phone called Nest. I don't know if any of y'all got Nest, but it's, it's basically an app that you can be here right now. Like my, my, my son is, is at home right now. I'm going to turn this app on. He's in West Palm Beach. He's done this to me before. And what this app does, see that? It's 68 at home because Irene is in menopause. <laughs> and what I'm going to do to my son is I'm going to turn the heat on at home. It's awful. And I'm going to turn it up. Jimmy. To 80. So wrong. Jimmy, what are you doing? I have an app that can change the atmosphere somewhere else. And what you all don't realize is God's presence is an app. And at that moment, I got on my knees. Mm -hmm. And I said, God, I really do love her. I don't want to leave her. If there's any way that you can change it, can you do it? And I said, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. In the name of Jesus, there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. And 2,000 miles away, at the very moment, Irene stood up and said, I'm an alcoholic. And the atmosphere that I was creating at home was changing the trajectory of her life yep. 2,000 miles away. And do you know that this same app works from what you're dealing with right now when you're present to next week? You can change the app and the atmosphere into a situation that you don't even know about. Because you got to learn to lean into his presence. The Bible says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And I think that some of us, can you stand with us, that some of us don't realize that even though we're in a midnight season that we think it is, it's already a new day. You're just counting wrong because at midnight, tonight at 12 midnight, it is dark outside. Guess what? At 12.01, it's still dark outside, but it's a new day because midnight only lasts for 60 seconds. And I want to know, is there a woman in this house tonight that will change the atmosphere of where she's been, change the atmosphere of where she's going, change the atmosphere of her husband who is home right now and her children who are home right now. And I believe tonight that somebody is leaving with a breakthrough tonight. I believe I believe tonight that somebody's going to say it's going to break every chain. I come against every disappointment. I come against every spirit of discouragement, every spirit of despair, every spirit of defeat in the name of Jesus.
Because we're going to lean into his presence. The Bible says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas, they sang, man. They got into the sweet spot of God's presence. Come on, worship team. And they got into a place. And I want to ask you tonight, can every woman find a place in this room? Can you lift your hands up where you are right now? Can you just begin to sing this song in God's presence? And I don't want you to be thinking about the lyrics. I want you to think about the lifestyle that's about to change.